Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Tier, and I'm a PhD student at SPIA in the Science, Technology and Environmental Policy program. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Ana Baptista, who is an environmental justice scholar and professor based at the New School in New York City. Dr. Baptista holds the titles of Assistant Professor of Professional Practice and Associate Director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center. Dr. Baptista focuses on topics including land use and zoning tools for environmental and climate justice, zero waste systems and anti incineration policies, equity implications of climate mitigation policies, and more. Her research and professional practice involve working directly with impacted communities and coalitions to support the advancement of community led strategies for just transitions. Dr. Baptista is also involved in a range of organizations, including but not limited to the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform. She has testified before Congress on the climate crisis, and her ongoing work with environmental justice activists in Newark was featured in a recent documentary film, The Sacrifice Zone. You can find her forthcoming chapter titled Radical Resistance and Future Imaginaries for Environmental Justice in the new book, The World We Need, coming out next month. As a final note, I'm thrilled that we'll be hearing from Dr. Baptista because her research has and will continue to inform our program's growing focus on environmental justice, and especially given her work with local communities in Princeton's home state of New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baptista to speak with us today. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for a great introduction. I'm gonna try sharing my screen here and not mess this up. So let's see if I can do this. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. If not, I'm sure Melissa will tell me. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you all for the invitation to be with you virtually um, and have a conversation with you today about some of the things I've been contemplating uh, during my sabbatical. You, I was telling the folks that this is uh, one of the few presentations I'm making during my sabbatical because it's a topic that um, I've been reflecting on quite a bit and thinking about and, and working on recently. Um, so I'm using this really as an opportunity to kind of think through some of these reflections um, and lessons learned along the way and have a conversation with all of you about it. So um, it's funny because, the, you know, these definitional issues are seemingly simple. You know, I grew up in an EJ community in Newark, New Jersey, and I sort of thought, you know, you kind of know it when you see it. Um, but like so many things, uh, especially in, in policymaking, definitions really matter. Uh, problem definitions are key and they're imbued with, with meaning um, and, and the politics of this are, are, are inherent in the exercise of defining uh, these terms. Um, they sort of reflect the ideologies and theories of change and ultimately many of the strategies that we deploy in our understanding of the problems um, that we seek to address. So, you know, uh, one of the key areas that, uh, I've been reflecting on since I started my career in this field is around what is environmental justice. And I teach this course on environmental justice. So one of the first things we do as a class is try to def define EJ. Um, and you know, some academics like Ryan Holyfield tell us, you know, the pursuit of a stable and consensual definition is really misguided, but uh, nevertheless, it's an important exercise, I think, for us to reflect on. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you a, just a quick little story about de these definitional questions. I, I, uh, one of my first jobs coming out of grad school at Brown University was working for the Department of Environmental Management in Rhode Island. And uh, at that time, and I'm going to date myself in the early 2000s, so I'm, I'm very old, <laughs> folks. But in the early 2000s, that was my first job out of grad school, and I'd been working on environmental justice issues and the uh, folks at the department there were wrestling with whether, whether to call this new policy that they were formulating environmental equity or environmental justice. And, uh, you know, for, for many years now, the environmental justice movement had uh, codified the term environmental justice in their principles in 1991. And so I didn't understand. I turned to my boss and I said, well, you know, why all the fuss? Why not just call it environmental justice, which is what the EJ movement has, has called it. And she turned to me and said, Anna, justice implies more, it requires more. And there, there it was um, in, in black and white. Um, the, the term justice and environmental justice is actually tied to a historical um, sense of, of the types of racism and oppression that are faced by communities 
Um, and you see this in the preamble of the environmental justice principles that were developed by people in 1991. And you see that the, the idea, the ideal of environmental justice um, implicates a political, economic, and cultural liberation that goes back to colonization and, and slavery and, um, and the dispossession of people. And so in fact, equity and justice are, are extremely different. And you'll see that reflected in the terms used by the federal government, like the EPA's definition uh, versus the movement's definitions in both the uh, principles of environmental justice from 1991 and the Jimenez principles for democratic organizing, which were established in 1996. Um, and, you know, there have been many scholars, uh, Bunyan Bryant and, and Robert Bullard and, and David Schlossberg, who have um, really fleshed out what we mean by environmental justice. You know, often when we define the term, people define it in negative terms, sort of what it's not, you know. Um, environmental injustice is often thought of as sort of the maldistribution of, of uh, environmental goods and bads. But uh, in fact, there's a lot more to the term environmental justice and that ideal. And David Schlossberg's, you know, has this tri parrot definition that um, has been, you know, widely adopted and, and has been expanded over time um, that draws on a lot of liberal notions of the term justice uh, in the environmental justice term. Um, to go beyond just distributive consideration of, of the distribution of goods and bads um, to, you know, the dimensions of recognition, sort of the freedom of oppression and domination, procedural justice in the form of, you know, real participatory democracy and uh, empowerment and capabilities justice, really the capabilities necessary for healthy and functioning communities. So, um, you know, the EJ movement itself has a much more historicized plural notion of justice that has many of these aspects of justice embedded within them. Um, and really critical to the EJ movement's uh, analysis of environmental justice is also an expanded notion of what counts as the environment. And more importantly, sort of the driving root causes of inequality across multiple and intersecting dimensions, right? So not just simply ecological, but economic, political, and other dimensions of intersecting injustice that, um, that present themselves in EJ communities. So um, just as the term has been, you know, sort of wrestled over, the term environmental justice has been wrestled over, the EJ movement's pressure on the state, and I, and I use the state uh, with a big S, um, federal, state, different forms of government, response to EJ demands um, were really growing through the 1990s. Um, Clinton, President Clinton signed an executive order on environmental justice in 1994. And folks thought at that time that th that would signal a shift in uh, decision-making by the state um, in taking into consideration the, these demands uh, from communities, mostly communities of color um, that were facing sort of disproportionate environmental hazards and risks in their communities. And what happened actually was that after that executive order was signed, it was largely seen as a symbolic marker. In other words, there was some recognition that environmental injustice existed, but um, really superficial efforts to address those, those issues substantively. Uh, and what we saw since the 1990s into the 2000s, early 2000s, many states, you know, at, by 2007, over 40 states had adopted some form of an environmental justice policy or um, piece of legislation. Um, and many of these policies that states were producing in the mid 2000s were largely symbolic. So uh, most of them acknowledged some form of environmental justice or environmental equity. They tacitly recognized EJ um, and many of them set out to study the problem in, distribu in distributive terms. So they set out to sort of look at where are the presence of environmental hazards and risks in relationship to different socio-demographics in our state. Uh, they formed subcommittees and boards or interagency task forces, largely with advisory roles. Um, and in some instances, states adopted uh, enhanced public participation processes, but really without any substantive power sharing attached to that, um, adv those advisory roles. So, you know, what I would say about most of what's happened in terms of environmental justice policy making by the state up until this point has been that it has been largely focused on a very benign and superficial form of procedural justice, right? Um, it has not gotten to, the, to this point of actually addressing the structural and uh, you know, 
even distributive forms of injustice that we see throughout the country. And so there's this big question, you know, you know, is EJ coming back on the scene at the, at the state and federal level? Um, one of the key stumbling blocks to addressing environmental justice issues through uh, uh, government processes, you know, regulatory processes has, has been the assertion by um, agencies that EJ claims are difficult to address because they're based on a determination of cumulative impacts, right? They're the product of sort of legacy environmental racism that's been sedimented over time in the geography and of the places where we live. Um, where we have like, you know, extensive residential racial segregation um, and industrial land patterns that sort of follow that uh, racial legacy of segregation. And um, EJ communities often contest pollution and burdens in their communities on the basis of cumulative impacts. In other words, these communities are facing not just one pollution source from in one pollutant, they're facing uh, really the cumulative effect of both environmental and uh, social, you know, extrinsic and intrinsic vulnerabilities um, that are impacting their communities. And that regulatory, you know, laws, environmental laws have not been designed to really address, you know, most of our environmental laws uh, were developed to address, you know, by media and by facility, by pollutant individually, and not to consider the interaction of all of these things. Um, so it's been, the state's stance that um, they really don't have a way or a mechanism both legally and technically to address the more complex notion of cumulative impacts. And, you know, I know, you, I think uh, Dr. Nikki Sheets, my colleague has been here and he, he talks extensively about cumulative impacts, uh, multiple pollutants from multiple sources and their interaction with each other and with non-chemical stressors like health and social vulnerabilities. Um, now, this is, you know, although it's a new topic in the sense that it's an emerging topic in the environmental justice context, cumulative impacts are not new uh, ecologically or epidemiologically. This, this has been addressed both in NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, um, and in various other epidemiological studies that have attempted to look at chemical and non-chemical stress, stressors um, in populations. Um, the complexity, of course, is when you're adding and, and looking at, you know, both the additive and synergistic effects of, um, you know, non-chemical and chemical stressors, vulnerabilities, you know, underlying susceptibilities, uh, many different factors interacting with each other. And uh, there is increasing empirical evidence and also methodological approaches that have tried to address what are some of the different ways that, um, regulators can begin to understand and wrestle with cumulative impacts. And probably the most mature version of this can be seen in California. So California is probably far and away the state that's got the more, most advanced approach to cumulative impacts in an environmental justice context. Um, and this is a result really of really robust um, collaborations between academic researchers working closely with uh, environmental justice advocates in the state, um, as well as state regulators. And uh, Rachel Morello frosch and Jim Sad and several others out of UC Berkeley um, and other, other universities in California started working with a group of environmental justice activists in the California EJ Alliance um, in the early 2000s, really to start to begin to develop an EJ screening method um, that they published and they, they looked at, you know ways to rank and add different indicators, um, both hazard proximity, exposure data, vulnerability data, climate data across the state. And the other thing about California is that they have some great um, data um, at the state and at the granular level or at census track level. So that made their exercise a little bit um, more advanced than other states who might not have as much uh, good quality data at the state level. They published their results and much of their research on the EJSM method became uh, the platform for the state, eventually the Cal Environmental uh, Protection Agency to take up this issue. They developed a tool called the Cal Enviro Screen Tool back in 2013 based on the EJSM model. Uh, and they worked closely with the uh, academics and EJ communities to develop the screen. It was publicly released 
and then codified in legislation, the state of California then uses the Cal Enviro screen methodology to rank all the census tracts in the state according to 22 indicators um, to, to assess relative cumulative impacts. Uh, the EPA also developed the screen. Actually, the EPA has had several versions in beta, um, beta testing for, for decades uh, around uh, environmental risk, exposure, vulnerability, um, but never wanted to release anything publicly for fear that it would um, result in communities identifying or inferring harm that they were not prepared to really address. Um, but under quite a bit of political pressure, uh, the Obama administration finally released the public version of the EJ screen in 2015 that uses 11 environmental indicators uh, that they have national data for and some ad seven demographic indicators. Um, now, this EPA EJ screen tool, maybe some of you have gone online and used this and looked at it and you've probably seen a lot of gaps <laughs> or issues with the tool. Um, the tool is expressly um, comes with a with a very big uh, warning label that says you should not, under any circumstances, use this to define an area as an EJ community. So uh, they've put that out uh, very clearly. You know, they're very reluctant to use this, any single standard to apply across the country, um, and they cite that you know obviously there are, are you know, very different. Uh, contexts uh, that would use such a definition under regulatory actions so that they are hesitant to apply a single standard definition. Um, now speaking of definitions, one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time on, and I'll, I'll focus most of the talk here on this particular issue, which is how you define an environmental justice community. And this term is used interchangeably often with other terms terms like environmental justice population, environmental justice area, disadvantaged community, or overburdened community. And all of these terms sometimes get used interchangeably, um, and they can mean the same or, or very different things depending on who's using them and in what context. Um, I would say that generally speaking, a disadvantaged community is a community that um, it implies uh, some socio-demographic indicators. So usually race and income indicators, sometimes also um, educational attainment, linguistic isolation, um, but disadvantaged community almost always implies some socio-demographic characteristics. Uh, while an overburdened community often refers to sort of a geographic area where a population is described using, you know, some aspect of a burden, either environmental stressor or socioeconomic stressors um, that disproportionately may harm a population in a particular area. Uh, now an environmental justice community sometimes is, is used by people to indicate a disadvantaged community, basically just to indicate a community that is of color or low income or both. Um, Sometimes people use an environmental justice community to delineate both a community that is disadvantaged according to sociodemographic indicators and overburdened. So sometimes the EJ definition is just using the disadvantaged community. Sometimes it's implying both overburdened and disadvantaged communities. So it really depends who's using the term, but this is the part of the presentation that I stopped to remind people that race matters. Um, and this is because I've taught this course on environmental justice for so many years and given many of these presentations and inevitably people will say, it's well, you know, all you need is income because it's all about in all these um, factors of exposure and risk are driven by income. And the reality is that the empirical evidence actually tells us and the history of racism in this country tells us that in fact, that's not true. That race much more than income, um, much more importantly than income um, really defines, um, you know, or determines a community's exposure to environmental risk and harm. Um, so race is very important. And there are many, many studies that point to this issue. Uh, and while there is overlap with race and income, certainly uh, race still is a very important factor in considering environmental injustice. Um, and we see this in many different studies. Now, keeping that, the fact that race is very important in mind, there are also very important legal challenges that have been raised to using race in uh, any standards in federal and state law. Um, and 
you know, many of you might be familiar with some of the legal challenges around, um, you know, using race for, for example, um, getting into Princeton. Um, so race has been challenged um, in, in many different court cases. And so there's a, there's a sensitivity to using race and ethnicity in some jurisdictions. And in some cases, because of that sensitivity, race is removed um, and linguistic isolation or income or other factors or characteristics are used as surrogates um, to replace race when um, that becomes uh, a factor. That was the case in California where they did not use race in their indicators. Nevertheless, there have been many states that have identified uh, an environmental justice community or a disadvantaged community using race um, and income. And many states use what we call a threshold-based approach. Uh, there's a study by Dana Rowan, uh, Rowan Gould here that I featured this chart from, um, and she looked at the definition of environmental justice communities used in transit agency analyses in California. Um, and I find that these different buckets uh, of EJ community identification follow uh, what I see in states across the country where most states are using a threshold-based approach. In other words, they're using sociodemographic data um, and thresholds of those different data sets to, um, to identify communities. Uh, some states are using communities that self-identify. So either through a petitioning process or some process by which communities claim this, this moniker of environmental justice uh, using various criteria set out by the state and themselves. Um, and then California sort of uses a hybrid approach which um, includes indicators um, and community-based identification uh, where EJ communities have ground truth the indicators. Now, um, you know, I set out, you know, with the help of my center to kind of look at what states not, have not only passed EJ laws or policies, but um, which of these states have actually codified a definition of an environmental justice community. And I specifically was interested in this question because uh, I was, you know, working with the New Jersey EJ Alliance and ICC in New Jersey on an environmental justice bill in New Jersey. And one of the first things that state agency regulators ask you and state lawmakers ask you is, who else has done this and how did they do it? And so it was really important to look at not just what other bills other states have passed, but how they have defined these communities so that we can kind of see uh, the breadth and range of approaches. And in that examination, we found 13 states had some version of a definition of an environmental justice community. And um, some of them were enacted through legislation. So they were codified in the language of the legislation related to EJ. And most of them had policies that codified a definition through their state environmental agencies. Um, so here's some examples, you know, um, California, defined a disadvantaged community using the Cal Enviro screen scoring method. Um, and this is codified in two pieces of legislation in California, um, specifically um, to target investments from their cap and trade program. And so they designate a disadvantaged community as the top, um, the top 25 high scoring um, census tracks in the state uh, according to the Cal Enviro screen indicators. And there's about 22 indicators across exposure, proximity, uh, socio uh, demographics and social vulnerability indicators. Um, and in this case, they're trying to apply the definition to um, the targeting of resources. In New York, um, you see the definition or, uh, or using a threshold approach, which is which most, most states use a threshold approach uh, where they identify an environmental justice area for the purpose of power plant siting. So in the state of New York, there's a bill that says if you wanna site a new power plant, you have to first see if the power plant is in an environmental justice area. And if it is, uh, it's subject to enhanced public notification and public process. Um, so in this case, an EJ area is defined um, by um, the proportion of the population in the census black group that is my minority and low income. So minority, uh, you'll see that the, the racial threshold is different for urban versus rural. And that's really important because in a state like New York, you have very different demographic um, characteristics in upstate versus downstate. And in Connecticut, they defined an EJ community. They were the first states to actually codify this in the 2009 EJ law that provided enhanced public participation in the permit reviews. 
and they use just income. So they use uh, the federal poverty level, they use low income. Um, in New Jersey, so all of this research was really trying to help influence the state of New Jersey's EJ bill, which, uh, like I said, we were very actively engaged with the state and, and state legislators around the definition that New Jersey uses actually defines overburdened community. And it's funny because Dr. Sheets and I were talking about this the other day, you know, we, we were so really invested in the definition, we didn't really um, push for the changing of the term because the term is really referring to a disadvantaged community, not an overburdened community because the definition does not refer to any environmental or health stressors that would determine uh, an EJ area. Um, so it's really the definition of a disadvantaged community, but in the bill, it's called overburdened community. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, mismatch in the definition. Um, but the definition that's codified in the bill, um, S232, is really using the definitions that the EJ advocates really pushed for, which includes income or race or linguistic isolation. The definition is very expansive, um, decidedly so, and it covers some or a portion of three over 300 municipalities and uh, over you know half the you know half the population of New Jersey and uh, in very densely po uh, populated areas of the state. Just a little bit about the evolution of the bill. You know, how did we get to this bill in New Jersey specifically? Um, in New Jersey, back in 2012, Senator Weinberg had a version of the same bill, but in that definition definition burden community had to meet all five criteria listed here. It had to meet an income criteria, uh, minority criteria, and the, the presence of several different types of facilities in, in, the, in the census area. Um, the version that we have today comes out of a bill that was originally introduced by Senator Singleton um, in 2018. And in that version of the bill, um, interestingly, they selected a threshold that was just based on median household income. And it just picked the lowest ranked 33 census uh, percent of the census tracts in the state, um, which was an interesting approach. It was actually quite inclusive as a definition. So it wasn't a, a terrible definition. It was, we thought it actually improved on the 2012 definition, um, but median household income was had some problems. Uh, and the fact that race was excluded, we felt uh, was significant. So in the 2019 and 20 version, we were working very closely with Senator Singleton and the state agency, the DEP, to come up with uh, a definition that we felt uh, as EJ advocates was most protective and most inclusive. Because unlike in California, where they're trying to sort of direct resources and target resources, uh, in New Jersey, what we were trying to do is protect, you know, bring as many communities as possible into uh, the purview of this bill that would get um, additional, potentially get additional protections uh, in the permitting process. And so the version that the DEP proposed, the state's definition, um, they went to a threshold based um, indicators. They, they used, instead of a 33% of the, you know, the census tracts, they, um, put income, 50% of the, the, the census block groups would have to qualify as low income uh, and um, race. So they 40% you know, of the residents in the black group had to identify as black, Hispanic uh, members of a street recognized tribe or linguistic isolation. So in this definition, it was a much narrower definition because it said you had to be both low income and uh, a specific Cla uh, class of minority in the state. It was strange because as EJ advocates, we, we were like, one, why are Asian and Pacific Islanders excluded from this definition or people of more than one race? Um, two, they had a very high threshold for um, low income. The state, you know, the average in the state of New Jersey's, you know, 21% of the state um, uh, is, is low income. So having 50% threshold is pretty high. And, um, and, you know, it really excluded like sort of middle income black communities, for example, in New Jersey. And so our definition, this expanded definition, you could see a lot more purple in this map. And that's because we really were trying to advocate for a definition that said you could either be low income or a minor, uh, largely minority um, census black group to qualify under this definition, not both 
Um, and that was really important because it expanded and you know, more than doubled the number of census block groups that would be considered. Interestingly, we thought that the, the omission of Asian and Pacific Islander uh, categories was um, some sort of mistake or you know, oversight. But in fact, the state agency folks said, oh, no, we, you know, the state of New Jersey has a large population uh, of, of Asian, um, of Asian populations that are high income. So they didn't, they actually tried to exclude Asian, the Asian population from the definition explicitly. So, um, you know, in today's context, we can see that, you know, we, we were really adamant that, you know, um, any racial minority, you know, basically anyone other than white alone, Hispanic, not Hispanic, should be included in that category. Um, and we made this case around including race specifically because of the history of racism um, in this country and in New Jersey, uh, where even if, you know, you're a community of color that isn't currently impacted by pollution, that by the nature of the kind of discrimination that you may face, um, or both historic um, or current, that um, you may in fact face increased risk and exposure um, or, or susceptibility. And so, you know, we really wanted to make the case that in the application of this, uh, this new law, that we wanted to be as expansive as possible and include as much of those communities, as many of those communities as possible. So we recommended that the lowering of this threshold of, for income as well to get more in line with the state average. Um, so if the state average is 20, above that, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40, and actually we ended up at 35, which was a compromise, um, using uh, the or, not the and, for race and income. And, you know, of course, expanding the minority definition to include Asian and Pacific Islanders. Um, so the bill was passed with many of our recommendations and signed by the governor last year and is currently in the rulemaking process. And uh, it's, I, I haven't included that in this presentation, but there's a lot that uh, we're working with the state on in terms of really wrestling with cumulative impacts methodologies and definitions. You know, how do you determine disproportionality, um, you know, using specific health and, and uh, environmental indicators. So we're also working with folks in California um, to you know, learn about some applications of the Cal Enviro screen for New Jersey as well. So, and I just wanna make a point that, you know, the, the part of this bill that's really a landmark, makes it a landmark bill because, you know, like I said, many states have an EJ policy or law, but what makes the New Jersey bill different and really, um, standard bearing is this one word shall. Um, and I, you know, having done this work for, for, for a long time, the significance of that word is really, really important to understand. It's the only bill in the country that says to a state agency, you are not only, you know, not that you may consider disproportionate incomes or cumulative Im impacts, you know, not that you can have a public process about it, not that you can inform an advisory group to study it. It says you shall deny that permit on the grounds of cumulative impacts. Um, and that is a very important statement that doesn't, you know, it still means we have to pay very close attention on the rulemaking for how exactly the state will determine cumulative impacts. Uh, but it nevertheless gives the state the very tangible tool to say no. And it's the only bill that says you must say no, not that you can say no, that you must say no in those cases. So it's a very important standard to, to point out. Now, these definitional issues, there's a lot happening at the state level with EJ laws right now um, on the heels of the New Jersey bill. But there's also a lot of federal action. And in fact, many of the federal EJ bills that have been coming out in the last few years helped inform the New Jersey bill. We worked with Senator Booker's office very closely and they gave a lot of support um, to our efforts in New Jersey. Um, so um, Senator Booker and um, Duckworth uh, introduced EJ Act of 2019 and in 2020, we just heard Representative Grijalva reintroduced in the Environmental Justice for All Act for 2021. All of these EJ bills, although largely symbolic, um, had a lot of significant and substantive input from EJ academics and EJ communities around the country. And so all of these bills have within them definitions of an environmental justice community 
and um, can be useful guides or markers for states looking to implement uh, similar EJ laws. And so they're, they're, they're important and significant in that sense. They have a lot of vet, they've had a lot of vetting. Dr. Sheets actually worked with Senator Booker's office over many months, hosting over 60 phone calls to really dig into the details of how you define communities. Um, similarly, Senator Markey put out a bill just recently that's, you know, Nikki and I have been working with their office on. It's gotten a lot of widespread support um, that looks at EJ mapping and data collection. It actually has a chance of passage, uh, maybe in reconciliation. So there, this is a, actually a bill that might have some legs um, and has some funding attached to, to doing a more robust mapping of EJ communities. It also has a, a definition that folks can look at. Um, and you know, one of the other areas of work that I've been doing a lot of reflection on and work on um, even during the sabbatical has been with the National Equitable and Just Climate Platform. This is a group of environmental justice and mainstream environmental organizations that got together a few years ago to try to align around uh, an environmental and climate justice platform ahead of the presidential elections. Uh, many times the major environmental organizations of the country have very early input into candidates' uh, platforms, um, but EJ communities are largely left out of those conversations until the 11th hour. Um, so this was an effort to start really aligning our work early and influencing those presidential candidates forums um, and platforms well ahead of the uh, mainstream environmental groups and doing it in a, from a, a, an approach of environmental and climate justice, really centering EJ voices in that platform. And so, uh, we've been doing a lot of work now with the you know, transition to the administration. We've seen a lot of the work that came out of the platform influencing Biden's platform. You know, Biden talked about environmental justice on the campaign, and now his administration is certainly reflecting that in the first 100 days. He signed several executive orders of the environmental justice, and he actually hired uh, one of the conveners and the key conveners of the platform, uh, Cecilia Martinez from the Center for Earth, Energy and Democracy went on to head up his EJ efforts in the Center for Environmental Quality at the White House. So we're seeing a lot of the platforms work emerging in this administration. But one of the key things that we worked on as a platform was trying to understand and give guidance to, to agencies um, at the federal level around how do you identify an environmental justice area? Um, and we actually, through my center and working with the platform work group, uh, we're looking specifically at different applications of a definition, one for a mandatory emissions reduction policy. Dr. Sheets works on this extensively um, in the country, but really trying to say if, if we were going to have a mandatory emissions mandate for climate mitigation policies, how would we identify EJ communities under that kind of a mandate? And two, how would we identify EJ communities for the purpose of inv targeted investments? And one of the things that the Biden administration has targeted is um, the Justice 40 commitment, where 40% of investment benefits will go to what they call a disadvantaged communities. Um, so trying to understand the application in two very different scenarios. One is under a climate mitigation scenario where you're trying to ensure greater protection uh, through reduced uh, emissions and one through an investment, a targeted investment strategy. And we started doing some mapping, um, just some preliminary mapping to kind of get a sense of what a definition might look like. And we quickly realized we could not do sort of one single standard threshold definition across the country because of the uh, variability across uh, the country using race and income. So we sort of took a, what we called a New Jersey approach where we, we mapped um, thresholds of race and income based on each state's respective averages for race and income. And basically delineated communities that were above those state averages uh, to be EJ areas, um, just to see you know, what that would look like. Um, and so we mapped a couple of different things. We, we, we mapped both low income, which is you know, twice the po federal poverty level and federal poverty level. So 200% of the federal poverty level. We mapped, um, using both an and definition and an or definition. In other words, uh, block groups or census tracts that met both the race and income um, thresholds or you know, either of those thresholds to see sort of how much coverage of a state you know, 
um, shows up or doesn't show up when you use the either or the or. Um, and then we looked at, we zoomed in and looked at five states where we had environmental justice organizations and activists in the work group that could ground truth and sort of gut check what each of those states look like, because it was sometimes hard to look at the whole national map and get a sense of um, whether it was picking up things that we, you know, you know, communities that we sort of knew were EJ communities from our experience. So that's some of the work we've been doing at the national level in the work groups. Um, and, you know, we've got some early ideas about how uh, guidance could be de developed for a national definition. Uh, most importantly is to figure out what the purpose of the policy is so that you're defining EJ4, because you, you might have very different uh, definitions depending on how you want to apply it. In other words, um, if you're trying, you know, in our case, when we were trying to develop a definition that was for the purpose of um, protecting communities in New Jersey, for example, we wanted a, a more expansive definition. In California, they were trying to come up with a definition that would help them target limited resources. Um, so they wanted to get it to the communities that needed it the most. So they had a much more targeted definition. Um, in all of these definitional questions, it's really important to validate your threshold or definitions with EJ activists on the ground and giving them an opportunity to really vet definitions and test them out and gut check them. Um, but any definition we, we believe of an EJ community or a disadvantaged community must take into consideration sociodemographics, race and income. Um, and then we have some other insights about how you apply it to the mandatory emissions reduction policy. Um, so some future considerations uh, for everybody, um, things that I'm thinking about that the folks that I'm, my collaborators at the national and at the state level are thinking about right now is there's a lot of activity coming out of the Biden administration around environmental justice and a lot of demand for definitional um, you know, guidance. And we see that in the EJ scorecard that's being developed and the new screening tool that's going to be developed by um, different agencies um, and, the, and a task force that's now being created specifically on mapping and defining EJ communities. So that's going to be really important, especially in tracking investment benefits to communities. Um, but, you know, some of the questions that remain are, you know, how will, if we do come up with a federal definition or floor or guidance, how will that marry up with um, cumulative impacts mapping tools and existing state approaches if the state has one definition and the federal government has a different definition? How will you align those for different purposes? Um, there are lots of really smart lawyers <laughs> like Dr. Sheets thinking about how to counter legal arguments in the use of race-based standards in these definitions. Um, and of course, uh, the purpose of defining these things is always to look at the outcome. You know, how are these definitions actually impacting the substantive outcomes of policymaking? Um, and so that's something, you know, I put these two pictures from 1994 with Clinton and 2020 when we signed with Governor Murphy. There's a long way between uh, a policy that defines a community or defines a problem like EJ and one that actually says that that definition actually requires the state to do something differently. Um, so, you know, in, in, in between the definition, we really wanna be keep our eyes on the prize, which is outcome. So I wanna make sure I leave enough time for questions and conversation. So here's some resources that you can learn more about some of the things I talked about in the presentation, but I'm happy to stop now and hear from you all on questions and, and conversation on these topics. And I apologize, I kind of went fast through the end there because I wanted to make sure I, I left enough time for us to talk. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Fantastic talk. And we're, we're just getting some questions coming in on the chat. So um, maybe let's start with um, Evan Morden. Would you be willing to uh, say your question out loud? I believe Keely will unmute you. All right, Keely, are you, you're doing the unmuting just to confirm. Um, 
but for the moment, we'll, we'll maybe come back. Actually, let me, let me read that question out loud because I think it's really relevant, uh, get, us, get us started. The question is, the New Jersey law seems to be more preventative. What would an EJ law look like to give justice to communities who have already been affected? What does justice look like? Yeah, I know it's a great question. Um, the New Jersey law, it's true that it, it mostly deals with new applications, um, although the law does also um, get triggered with the renewal and expansion of existing permits. So there is a, a mechanism through the EJ law in which already existing pollution sources can come under the jurisdiction of the bill, but they can't be denied. In other words, they can't be stopped outright. They can only be conditioned or mitigated. Um, but what we say, you know, what we've been saying all along in the EJ movement is that we, we need multiple policies and multiple approaches to environment, to achieve environmental justice. Um, this is just one, honestly, one drop in the bucket. Um, it gets us a little bit closer to distributive, some form of distributive justice, but it's certainly not gonna get us um, all the way there. We're gonna need a lot more comprehensive policies. Um, and one of the things that we've been pushing for is embedding environmental justice into climate mitigation strategies of all kinds. Um, in, in the power sector, in, you know, um, in, in lots of different sectors in the transportation sector. So everywhere where we're trying to move new and ambitious policy and, and we pick climate because climate is an area of emerging attention and urgent attention. Uh, we're trying to embed requirements for EJ. So the mandatory emissions reduction policy, for example, is an example of that is trying to get uh, not just an overall reduction of emissions of greenhouse gases from power plants and saying we have to target other emissions from those same power plants in EJ communities. And that's, again, getting at that legacy pollution in EJ areas. Uh, but it's going to require a sort of a layered approach um, on multiple fronts. And so it took us many, many, you know, you know, hundreds of years to get into the situation and lots of different policies. And so it's going to take us um, you know, a very long time and lots of different approaches to chip away at that legacy as well. So I definitely think we need more than just this EJ bill. It's not a panacea. Thank you. Maybe can we go over to Nick's question? Uh, hi there, can you hear me okay? Great. Right. Thanks Dr. Bautista for a really informative talk. Uh, my question was just around whether these definitions that you're developing around EJ and overburdened communities, um, if there's opportunities to apply them to other kind of issue areas that are typically siloed, but obviously have relevance like housing or access to financial services, or are there other things that we should be considering when we're thinking about taking like a holistic approach to environmental justice and, and these other issue areas? Yeah, so the, the EJ definitions, like especially for disadvantaged communities actually um, takes a lot of cues from other sectors. So in housing, um, in particular, in community development, um, there are lots of um, good indicators and definitions that are already in use. For example, in Connecticut, they, their definition is based on this distressed communities indicators that they, that they have um, that's used in, in housing, in the application of housing um, and community development um, grants. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to kind of look across other sectors to see how they're def defining dis disadvantaged or distressed communities. And um, in fact, there's gonna be some requirement to look across different data sets that those other sectors are already using. Um, and put them together with some of the environmental data sets. Um, the cumulative in, impacts screening tool, there's gonna to be a climate and economic justice screening tool that the White House has been mandated to develop. So that will use what's available in the EJ screen, which is lots of environmental exposure data together with other economic indicators that come out of HUD, you know, lots of other, um, agency sectors. So yeah, there's going to be lots of opportunities to do that. And, and already that those sectors probably have much more robust actual definitions around race and income thresholds than the environmental sector does. Mm 
Great, thank you. Maybe we could go back to an earlier question from Bob Sokolow. Yes, hi. Uh, interesting presentation. I was been thinking for other, it's the moment, the overlap of environmental justice and some of the thinking I've been doing is about Native Americans, whom you have, uh, who often get missed and who have a, a very deep and special story. And two aspects are come to mind. Uh, one is the question of assimilation versus cultural preservation. When you talk about outcomes, which, is the, which of those outcomes in some of the other situations is really the goal? Um, and the second is this aspect of land, the immense tracts of land and a, an energy technology in the form of solar in particular, which will take immense quantities of land. And the question of whether solar, solar fields on reservations is something we should aspire to or try to avoid. And when I get, pose a question like that, strikes me at the heart of EJ, I don't know where to go next. What's the next step in thinking it through? What is the outcome, as you say, that is the de desired outcome? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, really important one. Um, you know, in, in many of the EJ definitions where their thresholds are used, um, special attention is paid under the, the race and ethnicity category to state and federally recognized tribal communities and indigenous communities. Um, in New Jersey, we actually not only um, did state, uh, you know, not only federally recognized, but state recognized tribes, um, as well as, you know, self-identified tribal communities. So like the Ramapo. Um, so it's very, very important. And when you're doing a national mapping exercise, one of the reasons, you know, when we looked at a place like New Mexico um, or parts of the, the these, the country that have, you know, really like clustered, you know, and then decentralized communities, tribal communities, um, even outside of reservations, um, you know, those definitional thresholds just don't, don't apply. So you have to have a special carve out in the definitions to try to capture um, tribal and indigenous communities. They may not show up using just simple thresholds. Um, and that's really important. Actually, we had Dr. Kyle White uh, as part of one of the EJ academics informing the national platform. And he had a lot of research on um, the, the different tribal considerations that have to come into play when um, looking at these definitions, uh, especially at the national level. Um, I mean, I think your question about the solar panels and the use of land, um, this goes back to one of the guiding principles of environmental justice, and it goes back to the guiding principles uh, of the Jemez uh, democratic organizing principles, which is, you know, we speak for ourselves and the consultation process, which is definitely part of uh, indigenous culture and indigenous sovereignty and self-determination would require for a real environmentally just outcome would require free and informed prior consent and consultation with communities on whose land um, and whose, you know, uh, whose you know, cultural survival is implicated in any decision like that, uh, especially around land. Um, so, you know, these definitions, you know, can't just be developed, our definitional questions can't just be wrestled with in isolation by academics uh, working alone, you know, with you know a bunch of data sets and GIS, they have to have some engagement and interaction uh, with the culture, the history, and the EJ um, communities on the ground um, who have direct experience, um, which is you know one, one of the things that came out of our platform um, conversations was really that any definition or any consideration of these has to be, um, has to require a process of consultation and iteration with EJ communities. Um, and that includes indigenous communities you know, that are impacted by that. Um, the, interestingly, the Grijalva bill actually um, hosted over 300 delegates. They actually did a roadshow around the country. They met in many uh, tribal and indigenous communities 
around that bill and got a lot of um, input on that bill. And that's the sort of model that we hold up for doing future um, legislation or definitional uh, exercises because it was such a robust process that many, many folks um, really bought into. But yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent reflection to think about, which is, you know, communities that are often forgotten or marginalized in, or invisibilized, especially in mapping exercises, um, geographic exercises. It's really important to uh, make those communities more visible. Thank you. So we're getting um, close on time here, but we do have um, two questions uh, in the chat that are related to each other, just a little bit about cumulative impact. Uh, if you could say a little bit more about the definition and um, a second question is who would actually be reviewing state documents um, to make sure that cumulative impacts in the National Environmental Policy Act reviews and permits are following the law. Um, and let me just say, I saw that a couple of questions just came in. So, so maybe we can try to get to one or two more after that. Um, yeah, so who would be reviewing documents? For NEPA, NEPA has a very specific application of cumulative. Uh, they do a cumulative risk assessment. They require that in the alternatives, you know, in, you know under NEPA an applicant has to develop several alternatives like the do nothing alternative um, and then different alternatives besides the one that the applicant is proposing. Um, and in that analysis, they're required to do some cumulative risk assessment. Um, so in that case, the federal, the, whoever the federal agency partner uh, is, you know, usually it's EPA, but it, you know, it could be the Coast Guard, it could be DOT has to consider those cumulative risk assessments. Typically at the state, you know, for example, in New Jersey, we're trying to develop a cumulative impacts methodology that would, you know, help the state make a decision, a determination on disproportionality, right? That, you know, how does this one applicant's permit impact, you know, cause or contribute to a disproportionate impact um, following the California uh, Enviro screen model? In that case, um, the, the applicant would be doing an analysis, um, but it would be based on a methodology, hopefully that the state has established and that the state regulators would be reviewing. Um, in addition, that analysis would be up for public review and public comment um, you know, early in the process, you know, before a determination is made by, by the state uh, and before even the permitting process gets underway technically. Um, although they could run in parallel with each other. So the state agency regulators would be reviewing that as well as the public uh, would be reviewing that analysis and then giving input in the public process to the state agencies to consider in their review. So yeah, um, usually the cumulative impact analysis is then reviewed by um, the applicable um, state or federal agency that is looking at the, the application of the permit. Great, thank you. And we're, we're pretty much at time, but maybe just a quick word about um, if you have just overall recommendations for, for Princeton University of how to be, how to better engage with communities on environmental justice work and other things at the university you might be able to work on. We had a question in the chat about divestment. So mm -hmm. things in that area. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What, what should Princeton do? <laughs> well, certainly I recommend, highly recommend divestment and reinvestment. Uh, the new school went through a divestment process. Uh, we were one of the few schools that actually divested our endowment. Um, and that was really a largely a factor of uh, a lot of advocacy and really good work, uh, organizing work by our students. Uh, but more important than divestment even was reinvestment. So, you know, when, when the university decided to divest from fossil fuels, the question was like, where can we actually proactively invest our funds that support, you know, environmental justice and climate justice goals. And that has been a longstanding demand as well. And so, and there's a, a you know, a lot of effort in the EJ movement and the climate justice movement. Uh, there's a, an effort called reinvest um, that tries to pool together uh, divested funds for the purpose of supporting 
uh, grassroots and um, climate justice projects around the country um, that are too small, but in aggregate might be, make sense. Also divest, divesting the, the pension funds of faculty like myself, which are big players like TIA, CREF, which is you know my pension fund that is a big investor in you know um, a lot of the, uh, the the pipelines that indigenous communities are fighting. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't definitely support that, but, you know, you're, Princeton is, you know, you're right in, in the home and the heart of environmental justice. Um, and I would hope that um, Princeton more than anything really does all it can to listen to the leadership of EJ communities and EJ activists in the state. You know, the tendency for most universities, and I sit in one, so I know this well, is to lead with your expertise and good intentions, you know, oh, I have good intentions, I have this expertise, I have these skill sets, I know what to do. Um, but that is not the EJ answer. The EJ answer is to, to listen to the communities that are in the lead and to follow them and to, you know, be uh, really in support and allyship with the communities at the, at the fence line and at the front line, rather than to be trying to get out ahead of them and parachuting in with uh, the tremendous amount of resources and capital, social capital that a university like Princeton has, you can quickly thwart and overshadow the work uh, and the hard work and the experience and the lived experience of EJ communities. And um, if you really wanna be an allyship, you have to take a back seat to EJ communities and really be in support of their work um, and shine a light on that work and on that leadership. So that would be my biggest piece of advice for Princeton. Great. Well, maybe on that very powerful note, um, it's a good place to, to end. Um, I just want to say thank you so much again, Dr. Baptista, for joining us today and to everyone else to have a good rest of the day.